Welcome to Tartarian Tales number 44, the CIA edition again, with a little bit of history on the Tartars that I hadn't heard before, and some more with regarding the Pan-Turanian movement. And the Turanians are basically what they believe to be a united group of the Turanians, the Semites, and the Aryans at one point in prehistory, which then split off into Turkish, Mongols, Tartarians, Uzbeks, Uyghurs, uh, Siberians, Tibetans. Everything was kind of associated with this. And so this CIA section is someone was um, with the CIA went and was required to do a lot of research on this whole area. And so they explored and they have some interesting insight. I'll show you right here the, uh, yeah, see, the Pan-Turanian idea. And then these are some of the categories in the book. I'll include the link in the info section below. But take a look at all these different uh, sections that have very interesting history about them, CIA style. So there's some interesting information and they uh, kind of got to the bottom of certain things and explained things in a different way than I've really heard before. So I wanted to focus on a few of the Tatar sections and then uh, leave a lot of it up to you. The first, pa the first chapter that's like 20 pages talks about the Pan-Turanian idea and movement about trying to unify these people again while also discussing inevitably kind of, I think, CIA style, how to break it up and how for Russia and communism to inevitably take over from these people who really wanted their liberties and freedom, which I think is uh, kind of a, a theme in a lot of our history, sadly, which hopefully can be eradicated soon. So some of the stuff I'll talk about will deals with Tamerlane, Timur, the Khans, the Khanate, and this first section is the subjugation of the Tatar Khanate. So we're going to start with that and uh, see where else we go, and I'm going to show all the text that I read at first and then a bunch of different artworks and cool pictures so you can check it all out and see what you think. So here we go, I'm going to start with this section, The Subjugation of the Tatar Khanates by Russia. I thought this was interesting. After the empire of the Kipchaks had disintegrated in 1502 and Russia under Ivan III became independent in 1505, freeing itself of tributes to the Tatars, the individual Khanates enjoyed several decades of peace until a retrograde development was initiated, subsequent to the allaying of the confusion reigning at the Russian court during the first half of that century, thanks to the energetic politics of Ivan IV, who mounted to the throne of the Tsars when only 16 years of age, and later earned for himself the cognomen of Ivan Groshi, Ivan the Terrible. He introduced innovations in diversified spheres, administrative, jurisprudence, finances, army, introduction of firearms, with relentless energy, and rid himself of his enemies, the Bulgars. Thereupon he turned to the securing of his eastern frontier and the commerce routes over the Volga to the Caspian Sea and the road to the fur land of Siberia against the eastern Tatar Khanates, who were about to secure backing from their racial comrados of the Ottoman Empire. The Russian struggle against the Tatar Khanates, which had begun under Ivan III and Vasily III, was now continued with great success under Ivan IV. In 1552, he attacked the Khanate of the Volga Tatars with a 150,000 men army. The capital of the Khanate was captured after a long siege and continuous bombardment with 150 cannon. The Khanate was annexed by Russia. Four years later, in 1556, the Khanate of Astrakhan was also subjugated and annexed by the Russians. In the same year, Bashkiria became a Russian vassalage. When the Russians, however, were involved in the Livland War and thus found themselves in great difficulties, the Ottoman decided upon an alliance with the powerful Crimean Khanate in order to wrest the Volga territory from Russia again and to liberate their brethren. The expedition against Russia under the direction of the Crimean Khan Devlet Gire, led to the capture and raising of Moscow in 1571, without, however, any permanent result. While at about the same time Poland and Lithuania united in a joint state, the Rizek Pospolita and moved against Russia, which protracted the Livland War, Russia finally emerging as loser. It recuperated thanks to imposing exertions under the guidance of then still governing Ivan IV, who went to work with relentlessness. Ten years after the sacking of Moscow by the Crimean Tatars, Ivan was again in a position to place weapons, ships, and money at the disposal of the courageous Ottoman of the Don Cossacks, Yormak, together with an army in order to 
opened the road to Siberia, in the capital of which Iskar Tobolsk, the Tatar Khan Kuchum reigned. Yermak succeeded in capturing Isker relatively easily, but Kuchum in turn was able after a short time to wipe out the Russian army due to lack of supplies. Yermak drowned on his flight. The Cossacks were withdrawn and after a short space of time a second Rus Russian army was dispatched, which captured the Siberian Khanate and subjugated it. Tobolsk was established as a fortress instead of Isker, and the neighboring peoples of Siberia were deprived of their independence. While Kuchun withdrew into the southeast steppes with part of his people, this victory over the Siberian Tatars introduced a new, new epoch in world history, because at that time, the way was open to Siberia and the Far East. So I thought that was pretty interesting. I can't help but examine what happened later and what's happening now in reference to this and you know how Russia comes back with more weapons, more all this stuff and how did they get it? What is the original origins of Russia? I'm, I'm not a historian, I'm just kind of looking at this from a, an artist in my own perspective but you know what I mean? This, these evil forces always kind of come in and break up these people that just want to exist and be happy and be free and I mean nomadic people, many of them. I think the Tatars were huge. I think they had palaces, I think they had nomads, I think they had kings, royalty, intelligent people, magi magicians, religious, spiritual, I think they had the whole gamut. And so, t but throughout time that's been erased and they have just kind of become nomads and that's it. But they always forget about the royalty and the power and there's always someone, there's always some force, like I don't know if it's been all overall led by the Brits, by the religion, the Christianity, the Pope, the Vatican who the helm of all this is, if it's stuff beyond the poles, but these forces, these Russian, this evil that always comes and feels the need to live their lives and combat good people and take over them and sh dominate power over them is just a weird alien force in history. And there always has to be more to it than mere words and historians that from our modern era can figure out. So I'm always looking at these. I don't know the facts. I don't claim to know the facts. I'm always looking at this with an imagination, just so you all know. But here we go. Let's go to the next section, which I thought was very interesting. The decline of the Mongol Khanates in Asia. With the Russian advance eastward over the Ural, territories again are involved from which the invasion of Western Asia and Eastern Europe was launched. The development of these peoples in their, nether, their mother country, Mongolia, as well as in Siberia, was retrograde after the collapse of the dynasty of Kublai Khan in China in 1368 under Togun Timur Khan, who is seen in some of these images you'll see, just impressions of him, although now and again interspersed with periods of spacious recovery to its former power. Togun Timur Khan, soon after his banishment from China, had to defend himself against the Chinese invasion of Mongolia undertaken by his enemy and banisher Hong Wu. This invasion of the real mother country proved disastrous. It was not until Biliktu Khan succeeded Timur, ruling until 1379 in the Khaganate, that conditions remained relatively quiet. Under his successor, Yusakal Yusa Khan, however, the Chinese again invaded Mongolia and brought about the final ruin of the power of the eastern branch of the Mongols through their victory at Lake Bayur. They exhausted themselves thereafter in never-ending tribal feuds, which made impossible either a united state structure or a consolidation of conditions. Interesting again, who is this force that get kind of supplying these things with the ability to just go and conquer at this particular time. In the meanwhile, another tribe assumed the leadership in the history of the Mongols, the Tumeds. They had moved to richer pasturage from the area of Ordos and had gained power and fame in the course of time. The most famous of their chiefs became Alton Khan, who after ceaseless fighting against China on peace being made in 1571 was named a prince of the empire. His Chinese name was Yen Tan. His campaigns of conquest went as far afield as Tibet, which had already been partially conquered by Kublai Khan, and brought with him to Mongolia as prisoners Lama priests who disseminated Lamaism, a branch of northern Buddhism among the Tumeds. When Alton Khan died in 1584, his son Songo Dugarong Timur succeeded him as chief. Thereafter, their influence diminished. About a, country, a century later, the Shakars, who settled in the Ordos territory, threatened with subjugation by the Kalmuks, accepted the rule of the Manchus, who had overthrown the Ming dynasty in 1644 at a convention of their chiefs at Dolanor in 1689. 
Expeditions in relations with China and Tibet led to rapid dissemination of Lamaism among the Mongolians, who completely lost their warlike character. Interesting. Was that done on purpose? I don't really know. And, you know, I mean, you see how different time periods change, how people can, generations can become docile just by new leaders, by new royalty, by invasive forces coming in and polluting the culture and for specific purposes. You know, they, a lot of these kings and stuff knew that they had generations to work with, like the ones now who've been grooming us all for generations to just be just useless. You go down the wrong path and think the wrong science, history, everything. So it's really kind of crazy to put the parallels on here and kind of see what remains of history because so much has been destroyed. So many libraries have been burned. And there's one part I'll show you that I'll read about where he talks about how just all these different historical museums occurred from all these different cultures all over the world and nobody had ever put them together in harmony that made sense. And it's only what survived. And you know, so many things got looted in every war and burnt and trashed and destroyed and removed from history forever. So it's very tough to piece all this together. Who knows if we can, but I hope we can get at least a good glimpse. I think we need to dig. But here we go. There's a couple more sections I want to read. This one was called the Tatar ASSR. Tatari, which was established on 27 May 1920, is the second largest autonomous republic of this area, but does not by far include within its administrative borders all the Tatars living in the Ural Volga area. The country has 25,900 square miles of area and a population of 3,067,000. It is subdivided into 63 rayons with 12 cities, 7 worker settlements, and 1,713 village Soviets. The capital is Old Kazan, rich in memories, with a population of over 400,000, situated just barely 4 miles east of the Volga. And think about back in the day when there's a lot of stories of Kazan having that many people in like the I-500s, I-600s. So it's so interesting that, you know, five, 400 years later, it still has that many people. How many times did it rise and fall and resets, build, and who knows? And then this part goes on to say, the Tatar ASSR is strongly interspersed with Russians who constitute 42% of the entire population. So that 1.288 million Russians live side by side with 1.779 Tatars. The total number of Tartars in the Eurovolga area, however, amounts to 4.5 million. Three quarters of the soil of their republic is tilled and 18% forested. Farming and cattle raising are the main pursuits in connection with flour mills, dairies, and condensed milk plants, as well as leatherworks. The city of Kazan is an old Turkic and Muslim cultural center and has 13 mosques and a university with about 1,200 Tatar students, a branch of the Academy of Sciences, an Oriental Pedagoric Institute, a house of Tatar culture, several research institutes, a theater, and a good national Tatar opera house. The city further has a chemical perfume and soap industry, large machine shops, as well as factories for food processing in a synthetic rubber plant, a factory producing typewriters, plants for the processing of furs, a film manufacturing concern, and the largest felt factory of the USSR. Kazan was founded in 1438 by Yulu Muhammad. At the time, he was Khan of the Golden Horde. South of Kazan, near the Volga, lies the concentration camp of Tetyushi, whose inmates either have to work in the mines or in forests. Definitely keep in mind the other Tartarian Tales CIA editions that I did, which talk about in the 40s how these Tatar nations, these areas were just taken over by communism. People were sent out to concentration camps in Siberia and all other places to work, to slave. Everything was taken from them and they were just infiltrated by everyone 20 years after that description just occurred. So it's, and then they started changing the museums, changing the art, changing the culture, changing the education, doing exactly what nasty, dirty, disgusting, filthy communism does. And it's just another case of it, and it's just gotta be stopped again. Another example of how much it has to be stopped. But here we go, there's another section. I got a few more I'd like to read. I recommend you checking out the whole book, but this is another cool one, the Crimean ASSR. It is a beautiful country. One does not like to surrender. It is often called the Russian Riviera. On the southern coast grow an abundance of fruit, especially cherries, apples, and pears, but also peaches, pomegranates, almonds, apricots, figs, olive groves, and mulberries. Tatar villages with their moss are surrounded by cypresses, hazelnuts, and walnuts, vineyards, and tobacco plantations. In the gardens grow magnolias, oleander, myrtle, and tulip trees. 
On the mountain slopes, we find forests with pines, oaks, elms, and beech. From the Russian bathing resorts, hikes can be made to beautiful palaces, ancient Greek and Genoese ruins, and old fortresses. Are they really ancient Greek and Genoese? I don't know. Visitors purchase souvenirs of beautiful metal, leather, and wool products, for which the Tatars are famous. There are also wines of excellent quality, north of the mountains, in the wide steppe. Large herds graze on pastures with rare flowers. Economy is based on fishing, mullets, mackerel, herring, sturgeon, salmon, and eels. There is much shipbuilding. In addition, there are flour mills, jam and pickle factories, as well as soap works. At Lake Satch, salt is produced, and in the extreme east, near Kerch, there are iron mines. And again, how does this 1900s one, which seems kind of like it has some purity to us now, compare to the ones in the past, these Kazan and these Astrakhans in the 1400s, the 1500s, when their prime was happening, when those things were being built, those amazing maculate moss, how much different was the prime than from what anything we know about? It's, it's tough to tell. And in regards to that difficulty of truth on this kind of subject, it, I want to refer to the disclaimer kind of that the author writes at the end, which I found very interesting, where he says, on the other hand, but of less importance for this dissertation, scientific circles are still uncertain with reference to the early history of these peoples. In order to overcome this confusion, the Chinese, Manchu, Mongol, Tibetan, Uyghur, Iranian, Arabic, and Byzantine source material, to mention only the most important, would have to be collected and collated as it is scattered over the entire world in museums, monasteries, libraries, and private collections. As there probably is no scientist possessed of a mastery of all these languages, nor of a sufficient knowledge of all these cultures, this source material would have to be made available in an easily accessible manner in trustworthy modern language translations. Not until then will it be possible to extract and compile from the mass of single dissertations all the data available in these sources. At present, there are no means to determine whether some of the historical data have been derived from source material or owe their existence to scholarly conjecture. A systematic collection and reproduction of this highly interesting source material for the history of humanity would greatly accelerate the pace of research. Thus, for instance, it was general knowledge that the original of the secret history of the Mongols was available in a Chinese transcription. It was not until recently that a German professor contrived to obtain and translate it. The author of this dissertation would probably not have taken the pains to collect this material if he had not become acquainted with so many upright characters and valuable human beings among these peoples. The words of a young Tatar who had fled to Germany from Kazan on the Volga are still ringing in his ears. This cultured Tatar had to flee when the Soviets began persecuting his family and arrested his father who had supported Muslim priests. He told the author shortly before he departed for Turkey that his father had said, Our intellect attempts to convince us we are lost in Asia, but our heart tells us we shall be saved. And I think that's very important because we all, our hearts are telling us so much and our intellect is being deceived by so many people and so many sources all the time that we just can't let it happen. We have to follow our heart and what we know inside. And that's what this whole community, this Tartarian community is going off of. They're going to what we know, what's innate with us, what's almost eternal that is being resurrected by these images, these arts, these stories that we hear and see. And we're going to piece it together. I know we are. And I thought this was actually interesting too because there's, he references the Uyghur Muslims in this particular part at the very end. And he says, um, Thus, for instance, prior to the war, the largest collection of Uyghur manuscripts was in the possession of the Prussian Academy of Sciences in Berlin, another collection in the British Museum, still another one in the Museo Goumet in Paris, as well as another one in the Bibliothèque Nationale of Paris as well. Still another collection was in the Asiatic Museum in Moscow, while Dr. Sven Heden had a private collection in Stockholm, and other manuscripts were to be found in the National Library in China, the rest of known extant manuscripts being in Japanese possession in Korea. So that's like having the history of all these nations all over the world. And how many private collections are completely unknown? How many things do you think in the National Library in China were destroyed during communism? Same within Moscow, same within Germany, may have been blown up in World War II. Just all these histories gone. And now the Uyghur Muslims are in a terrible situation in China with slave camps, as far as we know. And um, it's, just, it's just a disaster. So much of this world is being led astray. And so many times history repeats itself. And so many times this evil, this evil force of whatever it is, is just constantly 
taking down and beating down the people that just want to live happy, just want to learn about the miracles of the world, just want to figure out how amazing our human potential and perfect reality really is. And we've got this force just constantly beating us down, constantly putting us in fear, constantly doing things. That needs to be ended. We have to get to the truth of all of these things in our world. No more of the baloney, the lies, the absolute crap that's polluting our spirit. We have to get to the bottom of the truth. And I hope this gets us a little closer. And I hope you guys can uh, just continue to chime in with your insight. I absolutely love it. You all are incredible out there. This community is beautiful and perfect. So bless every one of you. And uh, stay tuned for a lot more.